Hello everyone, welcome to my messy studio. My name is Mark and I'm an artist and an art professor. And in this video, I'm going to demonstrate how I sketch a landscape using one of my favorite combination of mediums, watercolor over pen and ink. Unlike many of my instructional videos that are highly cropped, sped up and edited, I'm going to show you the process from start to finish, though sped up slightly, otherwise this video will be over an hour long. This will allow me to talk in detail about the materials I'm using and give you plenty of advice on combining ink with watercolor and color mixing strategy. Since I'm not cropping, there will be some moments where it'll be just me painting with a little background music. I don't know how popular such a video format will be in our fast-paced digital age where everyone, including myself, wants information delivered quickly, but I think there's benefit to taking things slow. Back in school, our instructors would demo for hours and hours. Yes, some of it was terribly boring and could have been explained in minutes, but not everything can be taught quickly, and if you're able to keep yourself from drifting off too much, I think there'll be tremendous benefit to it. So let's get started, and hopefully I won't lose too many of you along the way. Here's the reference I'm going to use. I believe it was taken in Trujillo, a wonderful town in the Extremadura region of Spain. Though I'm working from a photo in the comfort of my studio, my intention in this video is to show you the method I would use when sketching on site, using portable materials, a pocket pen, a small sketchbook, travel brushes, and a tiny palette. At some point, I'll have to make a video where I show you some of the practical tricks I use to make working plein air more comfortable, but for now, we're just dealing with a drawing process. I'm going to leave a detailed list of everything I'm using in the description section. But let's quickly talk about the materials I'm using in the inking stage. This is an Opus 88 fountain pen, a wonderful eyedropper filled pen that is now sadly discontinued. However, since this model was around for a number of years, you might be able to get one used on eBay. I recommend you seek one out. The pen is small, yet comfortable, has great ink capacity, and uses a high quality number 5 steel Yovo nib which can be switched out with many other options. In this case, I've switched out the original nib with a custom full flex nib from fpnibs.com, a Spanish company that specializes in all kinds of nib grinds. This nib is super flexible and delicate, capable of putting down an extra fine line and going all the way up to triple broad. These nibs go in and out of availability, so check the FP Nibs website if you're interested. For my ink, I'm using De Atramentis Document Brown, which is entirely waterproof. While black ink is my usual go-to color for ink drawing, I find that for landscape, the brown blends more organically with the colors I put on top, leading to a softer, less graphic effect. Plus, when a landscape has a lot of greens and grays, a warm brown can bring a nice touch of contrasting warmth to the image. This brown ink is one of my favorites, a beautiful dark brown that dries quickly, becoming highly resistant, making it very useful for working in the field. As for the paper, this is a watercolor sketchbook made by Hahnemuller, filled with relatively smooth, light gray paper. Toned paper has some advantages over white, the first being the ability to use white watercolor to add brighter values. The second and more significant is that the base tone influences the color scheme, giving you better control over the mood in your piece. Think of it like a photo filter, except that with a paper tone, you start with a filter and place the drawing on top. By the way, Hahnemuller also sells a sketchbook with watercolor paper that has a light brown tone. I bought one at the same time as I bought this one and have yet to try it, but when I do, I'll report back the results with yet another video. Here I'm working over an underdrawing done with an HB pencil. In a previous video, I discussed the pros and cons of two approaches. One where I start with a pen and then follow with watercolor, and one where I start with watercolor and follow with a pen. Both ways of working are legitimate, but I find that in subjects that have more architecture, where a bit more precision is required, starting with a pen first has benefits, making the drawing more precise. The buildings here are very old, with lots of rough weathered brick and tile, and I'm emphasizing the textures of the buildings with a slightly broken line. Breaking up the line will also help make these buildings look far away. The most important thing here is to be consistent with the line weight, with things in the distance receiving the thinnest lines, and things that are close being rendered with thicker strokes of the pen. 
Having a flexible nib like the one I'm using is very helpful in this respect. But you can also accomplish this with pens of different line weights, which is why I often carry three pens, an extra fine, a medium, and a broad. However, flexible pens, while harder to control, give you more versatility in your line weight and, to my mind, give you a more elegant line. The nib on this pen is very delicate, and I have to be careful to control the line weight on objects in the distance, especially because this paper has a slight texture to it. For things very far away, I use reverse writing, which means that I rotate the pen so that the feed faces up, resulting in an extra, extra, extra fine line. My inking process, while not fully systematic, usually runs background to foreground. This allows me to be more consistent with my line weight, making it increasingly thicker as I work my way towards the foreground, and also makes drawing the overlapping shapes easier. However, a simpler, more practical consideration is also a play. Because backgrounds tend to be higher, there's less of a tendency to smear your lines if you work from the top down. When drawing trees, a number of important principles need to be taken into consideration, which I cover in some detail in my other tutorials. The most important of these is to use line weight to indicate depth. But there's an additional equally important principle that comes into play when sketching a landscape as opposed to a single tree, and that is to emphasize a variety in the rendering of texture. Leaves come in a large range of shapes and sizes and the more sensitive you are in depicting that variety, the better your drawing will be. Since nature is full of similarities, many artists fall into the error of rendering everything as if it's the same, making their drawings monotonous. One of the key principles in art making is to always be asking, what's the difference? That is to say, focus on the differences you're seeing and emphasize those differences in your drawing. Since I'm working on gray paper with brown ink, which softens the contrast, I need to make my lines stronger than if I was working with black ink on white paper. Furthermore, when combining pen and ink with watercolor, I need to be bolder still, since watercolor wash will inevitably soften the lines.
it's important to know ahead of time what you plan to do with the ink and what you plan to do with the watercolor. The responsibilities of line should not overlap with those of watercolor, or the drawing will feel busy and uneven. In the approach used for the sketch, the lines are used sparingly, only to indicate the major edges of buildings and the stronger textures. Everything else will be done with watercolor. In the bare trees on the right, I'm taking advantage of the extreme flexibility of this pen to render the branches. Fortunately, the color of these branches are very similar to the brown I'm using, though I will most likely add additional color in the watercolor stage. Bare tree branches are very complex to draw. One important thing to know is that each branch needs to be slightly thinner than the one it grew from. Other than that, you really have to look at the tree you're drawing to determine the overall pattern. On some trees, branches will grow at flatter angles than their parent branches, but that's not the case here, where the branches seem to grow increasingly up. In the rendering of textures, a balance needs to be struck between pattern and specificity. What I mean by this is that to render texture effectively, you have to come up with a general pattern, since drawing every little detail is impossible. However, that general pattern has to vary in response to what you're seeing. For example, when I'm drawing a tree, I need to make sure that leaves are aimed in the right direction depending on where they're positioned. So, while I'm following a pattern, that pattern is constantly being adjusted based on a variety of factors. This is why rendering textures is one of the more challenging things in drawing. It's a boring task that unfortunately requires constant attention, because if you lose focus, you start mindlessly repeating the texture, making your drawing not only less accurate, but even worse, boring. Now that I'm done with inking, I'm ready to move to the watercolor stage. Again, since I'm using a plein air method, the materials here are chosen for their portability. I'm using a few travel brushes made by Escoda, their Ultimo line, which I made with synthetic hairs meant to mimic squirrel. Travel brushes in general are great, and I often end up using them even at home. The main concession I'm making to portability is this use of the tiny palette, sold under the brand Whiskey Painters, but manufactured by the Italian company Fomi. I'm planning on doing a review of my collection of portable palettes, but I might as well admit now that this one hasn't received much use other than in my videos. The main issue with it is not the color selection, which at 12 is actually fairly generous. It's the small mixing area, which limits the amount of wash you can mix up and forces you to constantly wipe it down. However, it does a good job fitting into the shot, so it's going to pop up frequently in my videos. I'm going to list the colors I'm using in the description section, but let's talk about them now. On the top row, starting from the left, I have Ivory Black, Burnt Umber, Hooker's Green, and Cobalt Blue. In the middle row, I have Ultramarine Blue, Alizarin Crimson, Cadmium Red Medium, and Venetian Red. In the bottom row, we have Burnt Sienna, Yellow Ochre, Cadmium Yellow Light, and Chinese White. This palette is actually pretty close to the palette I would use when using a larger box. I'm not an advocate of a huge number of colors, and really smaller palettes are easier to control and harder to make a giant mess with. In a larger box, I would also have a Cadmium Green, Prussian Blue, and Gamboge, which is a transparent yellow. These colors help expand the range of greens I can mix up, which is a useful thing. I would also include Sepia, which is a beautiful dark transparent brown. These additional colors are mostly range expanders, rather than foundational colors, however, and I can easily do without them. While it's true that a larger palette gives you access to a larger range of colors, in practice this is not as big an advantage as it seems. Many artists do powerful work with a very limited range of color, even more limited than the palette I'm using. So long as the painter is sensitive to the delicate and constantly varying shifts in color present in nature, the limitations of the palette will not be an issue. When watercoloring, I follow a simple order, which I often violate. It goes like this. Background to foreground, big to small, light to dark. For example, following this order, I will lay in the farthest thing away, which in many cases will also be the largest element, the sky. The problem with following this order strictly is that in plein air painting, time is of the essence. The light is changing, your butt is hurting, your stomach is growling, and the paper is taking its time to dry. While I might wait in the studio, or use a hairdryer if I get impatient, in the field I'm going to keep moving, working somewhere else while the previous wash is drying. 
But let's face facts. This is not the only reason why I'm less systematic than I should be. Sometimes it's because I notice something interesting, a momentary light event, or a cast shadow that threatens to move at any moment. But more often than not, it's because I simply lose focus, get distracted, and start working elsewhere. While this kind of attention deficit can be detrimental to your work, I wouldn't fret over it. In making art, there should be an element of play, and you should always give yourself room to improvise and experiment and get lost to change your mind, get frustrated, or pleasantly surprised. While I do believe the great art is the product of careful planning and systematic and organized effort, being entirely workmanlike eliminates a large chunk of the chaotic fun of making art. I'll talk about my specific mixtures as I work, but three overarching principles govern how I mix my color. The first, and most important, is to always be aware of atmospheric perspective. For those not familiar, this is a series of rules that relates to how things appear in the distance, with things that are farther away having less contrast, being less saturated, and more blue, and things that are closer appearing to have more contrast, being more saturated, and being warmer in color. This is another reason why one should generally work background to foreground. By establishing the colors in the background first, you can systematically add contrast and warm up the colors as you work towards the foreground, something more difficult to do if you bounce around and work everywhere. The second important principle is to keep the color moving. Nothing in life is evenly colored, with things being influenced by the light and the things around them, and it's up to the artist to be sensitive to that constant shift in color. This means that I'm constantly mixing and remixing my colors, even if I'm painting a single surface. The third is to put large general areas of color in before handling the details. In oil painting, this is called an underpainting, or blocking in. This establishes the overall color scheme in a piece and lets you make better decisions about what specific colors to use. The thing is, colors are very difficult to gauge on their own, and the best way to determine the correct color is to compare it to a color next to it. Filling in the sketch with general colors allows you to make more accurate choices in the later stages. The initial colors you put down should represent the lightest value in that area, but you don't have to be so strict about it. Depending on what's there, I might put in a simple value or color transition. The key is not to spend too much time in a single spot and to fill the paper very early in the painting process. This is particularly crucial when working on a brilliant white surface, since the very bright value will interfere with your ability to gauge color correctly. Keep moving, don't get stuck anywhere for too long, and don't worry if the colors aren't exactly right. These initial colors, because they're put down in isolation, are frequently not entirely correct, but can be adjusted later once you move into the finishing stages. Besides semi-religiously following these three principles, which apply to watercolor painting in general, there are also a few additional rules specific to working with watercolor over pen and ink. Watercolor technique, when applied over an ink drawing, is different than when using watercolor on its own. To some extent, the washes need to be looser and simpler, since the ink is responsible for much of the detail, but there are some complications. The first is that you have to avoid going too dark in the shadows, since you obviously don't want to obscure the lines. The second complication seems silly, but is not so easy to overcome, and that is that you need to hold back on the detail and allow the pen to do the work, because if both watercolor and ink are doing the same task, the sketch might look busy and overworked. Besides these general principles, I also adhere to a few color mixing rules. The first is to avoid using black when mixing color. While black does have its uses, it generally doesn't play well with other colors and can lead to dull, ugly mixtures. In almost all cases, it's best to mix your neutral and shadow colors from other colors, the easiest mix being brown and blue. My choice of brown and blue is based on whether that shadow is far away or close. In distant shadows, I generally use burnt sienna and cobalt blue. In shadows that are closer, I use burnt umber and ultramarine blue. The reason for this is simple. Burnt sienna and cobalt blue are lighter and more delicate in color, which when mixed together create a more delicate neutral color better suited for things that are in the distance. Ultramarine blue and burnt umber when mixed create a darker neutral, better for those shadows in the foreground. 
While I can mix my dark neutrals out of only burnt umber and ultramarine, and simply control the value in the distance, I find that it's much easier to get a strong sense of atmospheric perspective by using this little trick. Another strategy is to mix up your greens from blue and yellow, instead of going directly to the green pigment. This is because greens tend to be softer and more varied if mixed out of their primary components. While you can, certainly, mix very complex, lovely greens using green pigments, it's more difficult since there's a tendency to spend less time thinking about the specific quality of the color and make all the greens the same. Mixing green is one of the more difficult aspects of painting from nature, since there's usually so much of it – green trees, green grass, green bushes. As with texture, it's important to constantly ask yourself, what is the difference? What is the difference between this green and that green? This is why I never mix up a big puddle of green, and I'm always mixing and remixing my colors. For greens in the distance, my usual starting point colors are cobalt blue and yellow ochre. Since yellow ochre is an earth tone, this mixture creates gentle greens that look like they're far away. Furthermore, both colors have a slight opacity to them, which softens the line work underneath, helping it recede in space. For the shadows, I usually drop in a touch more cobalt blue and add alizarin crimson. The red in alizarin desaturates the green, while the blue makes the color cooler, creating a delicate, convincing shadow. One common mistake I see beginners make is making the shadows too saturated green, especially in trees that are far away. My advice is this. Add purple to your shadows. Not only will this make the shadows more convincing, but the purples will also keep your painting from being monotonously green. As I start putting in greens in the middle and foreground, my general green mixture changes, and I shift from cobalt blue and yellow ochre to mostly ultramarine blue and cadmium yellow. This creates a slightly more saturated mixture and allows me to mix darker greens. My general shadow mix also changes and now becomes ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson mixed with my original green mixture. You'll notice that my green pigment is actually very rarely utilized and only for greens that are very close and never by itself. My usual way of working is to first try to get at the green I want to use using a base of ultramarine blue and cadmium yellow, and then, if I need something stronger, add green pigment into it. Think of the green like a rare and potent spice, used only on very special occasions and then sparingly, so as not to overwhelm the other flavors in the dish.
you may have noticed that the watercolor is not entirely transparent and has softened the line work slightly. This is something I tried to anticipate in the pen stage by making the line work stronger than if I was working with pen alone. The softening is also something that is good for the sketch, creating a softer, less graphic effect. However, toward the foreground, I like to go over the watercolor with my pen, reinforcing the line work in order to push the contrast and strengthen the sense of depth. One thing you'll find is that lines over watercolor will be wider and often a little bit wetter. This in the foreground is a good thing, but means that you should avoid using the pen in areas outside of the foreground, since the lines there might end up being too strong. Here is my finished sketch, imperfections and all. Other than the screw up and perspective in the tower, I'm fairly happy with it, though of course things can always be better. Since I'm working from a reference, I might try painting it again without the distraction and difficulty of having to record to see if I can improve on some of my mistakes. Though I love trying new things, experimenting with new materials and subject matter, I'm a big believer in the benefits of repetition. This allows you to correct specific mistakes in your process, but also can yield interesting results, since no two paintings can ever be the same. I hope all of you found this longer video useful, and if you did, please let me know, and I'll make more of them. My plan for this channel going forward is to switch it up, with short lessons on specific topics intermixed with long-form lessons such as this one. And of course, for those of you here for my art material and fountain pen reviews, I'm going to keep those coming as well. Thanks for watching, and see you back here in my messy studio soon. Bye for now.